we have already associated certain things to religious practices when they are being said as inspired by the Holy Spirit, many of us miss it. You know, when we're growing up, we were used to pastors coming up on stage really tired and frustrated and worn out. And while they're putting themselves together, they were saying, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And we just think, yeah, that's what they say, just to fill in the blank and to, and to buy time. But I tell you what, when the word of God says, make unto the Lord a joyful noise, it doesn't matter if the guy down the road is saying it just to have something to say. But we here say it because that is what the word of God says. And if we can put ourselves in the mindset of obeying the simplest instructions, we will find ourselves already in momentum for obeying specific instructions. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm telling you, just when we say, oh, give the Lord a big shout, you do it. You do the next one. You do the next one. And in the midst of that, God says a thing and you find yourself doing it without hesitation. You know why? Because it is the law of motion. What is in motion stays in motion. Oh yeah, so we're going somewhere today. And we're gonna break tradition today somewhat. And when I say tradition, I wanna be the one to admit that I have a tradition of not raising money. It's been my tradition, I don't raise money. I just let the providence of God speak for itself. Five years we've been doing ministry and one of the things the Lord said to me, he says, if you focus on raising people, you don't have to worry about raising money. And the faithfulness of God has been such that we have been able to do things without raising money, God provides. However, this week the Lord's been speaking to me because I have continually sought the face of God concerning certain things that need to be broken off of us. We've had certain things that have become a theme of the devil's attack upon the body of Christ in the times that we're in. And the Lord led me to the story of Jesus and Peter. When the tax collectors, the people collecting the taxes for the temple, when they came to Jesus saying Jesus needed to pay tax, Jesus was like, okay, I'm not going to argue with you because, I mean, we all use the temple. You know, Jesus teaches from the temple sometimes, right? But the point Jesus wanted to make initially was this. It was like, let me ask you all, from whom do the lords of the earth demand taxes? From their own or from outsiders? Jesus was not an outsider to the temple, but yet they were demanding for him to pay. So what did he say? I mean, if it was you and I, we would have commanded for deep sleep to fall upon them. We would have commanded, commanded the two angels that blinded all of Sodom and Gomorrah to appear and blind the tax collectors so they do not know where to find us. Oh, some of you already know how many times you have prayed against the IRS so that they forget that you owe them money. You know how many times you have paid for your tax refund to suddenly double or quadruple? You see, we, we would have used the powers that we have to override the conditions that we're in. But Jesus says, this is what we're going to do. Someone give me a coin. And they gave him a coin. And he said, whose head is on this coin? And they said, Caesar. So he said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. You know, I, sometimes I wish he had said, give unto God what is God's first and then before talking about Caesar. But he said that in that order because some of us, if we have not shown faithfulness in unrighteous mammon, heaven is not even expecting anything from us. Let me say this again. The Bible says, if you are unfaithful in unrighteous mammon, mammon is money. Who will give to you the eternal treasures of God's kingdom? We know the kind of supernatural experiences we want to become the order of our existence. We know certain chains that have been revealed to us by the prophetic that have to be broken that seem to still linger in awkward places, making it uncomfortable for us to express the liberty wherein we have been set free. We know in several areas of our lives, the shoe seems to be hurting for longer than we think we can accommodate and we're beginning to blister in uncomfortable places. 
We know because we know that there are things that have been promised to us that we need to actualize, but we have yet to be faithful in unrighteous mammon. Now, what did Jesus say after he made it very clear that even though they were making a demand on him that was not righteous, he still decided anyway to pay them to shut them up. So he said to Peter, it was like, go fishing. We will give them exactly what they need. But I haven't even gotten to the part of it that the Holy Spirit drew my attention to, but I believe it's very important for us to go over the story again for the benefit of those who may not have heard it before or read it in recent times. So Jesus asked his chief or his, prime, uh, his senior disciple, Peter, and asked him to go fishing. And he says, you will catch a fish. Open up the mouth of the fish and there will be a coin. And with that coin, you pay off these losers. It's interesting because, you know, I asked the Holy Spirit one day, I said, you need to break this thing down to me. Why money from the mouth of a fish? Could Jesus not have done that? and then produce the, the coin, then the Holy Spirit said to me, think about it. Why, what kind of coin ends up in the mouth of a fish? And then it made sense to me. Because when we used to kind of like walk around all of Western Europe endlessly, one of the things that I noticed that was common in, in, in that part of the world, particularly in the United Kingdom, is you find people, whenever they are going through difficulty or they have recognized a curse, they will speak the curse to a coin and toss it in the water. They were asking for money that was unrighteous. They were asking for accursed money, and that was exactly what they got. But that's not where we're going today. Jesus further on said to Peter, before Peter went out, because Peter was so eager to get that episode over with, before he ran off, Jesus said to him, once you get the money, don't just pay for me, pay for you. Now ask yourself, what kind of tax will be due in my name that will also affect you? If Josephine owes taxes from her salon, no one's going to ask Miss Z to pay it. You understand what I mean? I'm not saying you, I'm just giving an example. You're a businesswoman. Let's say you owe money on, you owe taxes on all the money you're, you're making from your salon. Z is not responsible. You are. But Jesus was asking Peter to pay for Jesus and Peter. The only times that I know of wherein I will owe taxes and it also becomes someone's benefit if he gets paid, is if we have done business together. Because if we have done business together, the moment one person pays, that payment is not just for them, it is for all of the partners together. And the Holy Spirit said to me, the things that I have been showing you, the things that I have been showing them, has been released, it is about to be received. However, it is not meant to be just for you, it is meant to be for you and them. And that was when it hit me that, okay, if it's going to be for you, me and for you, then we need to have done business together. I didn't discuss any of this with my wife. She doesn't even know where I'm going with this. She's hearing this for the first time just like you. But God raised her up today to say that sometimes what you need is not sending some more spit to heaven. In the name of saying that you're praying, what you truly need is just to receive instruction of what you must do. When they came to Jesus, they didn't ask to whom shall we pray to be saved. They said, what shall we do? To be saved. And so when she was saying that, the Holy Spirit said to me that you're not going to get, a, get a out of it today. You will say it today. Remember that on Tuesday, I did say to you that it's time for some of us to intentionally, to make up our minds, to become more intentional about supporting the work that is ongoing here. When we renewed the contract for this building, an addition, additional $1,000 was placed on it. Every month. And I just said, okay, you know what? I'll take care of it. I didn't even tell my wife. I was just like, yeah, we'll make it happen. Let's go. And so the Lord said to me, he says, 
It is not just for you. It is for you and them. Give others an opportunity to give. Many of us are wired to give when we recognize that there is a need. It is very, it's a basic form of giving. Okay, let me explain this, right? Some people will only give to you if they think that you need the money. You understand what I mean? Some people will stop giving to your church the moment they see that your church is doing big things. They're like, okay, these ones are fine. They're okay, let me go and find the next broke pastor who is just coming up. You understand what I mean? Some people don't give because they're like, oh, we don't need to give to your church. This person comes to your church. That person comes to your church. Just the two of them can take care of all of your needs. But that is not how it works. But that is how it is. Some people don't give until they see there's a need. I will tell you that there is, a, there is a better reason to give. You know, Chris here is not likely to invest his money in a company that is not doing well. You heard me. Most of us want to buy shares and stock in companies that are doing well. And it's not because we are worldly. It's because Jesus was the one who said that was the, he said that we will take from he who has none and give to the one who has. Jesus said that. And so that is what happens. You, with your little $5,000 that you want to invest, you'll be looking for Apple Corporation that already has a trillion because they have proven to be fertile ground. So if we don't take our investments and give it to the people who are in need, why are we always waiting to have a need before we invest in the kingdom of God? I'm going to say that again very slowly. You see, I know for sure that many of us in here, we're not going to get up and say, ah, there's this company, they just filed bankruptcy. How many people here have invested in Toys R Us in the last two, three months? Okay, in the last two, three years. Nobody. Why? It's not because they're completely out. They closed a bunch of stores. They're still operating. But because they're on the downward whatever, you don't invest in them. You're looking for the one that looks promising. We do that with our investment in the world economy. But when it comes to kingdom economy, you find people saying, I can't give to your church because God's really blessed you with a pastor that can pay for things. I'm going to go find a homeless person who has nothing and give to them. So you are investing downward when it comes to kingdom, but when it comes to the world, you want to invest upward. We've gotten it backwards, folks. We have gotten it backwards. I would rather give somewhere wherein they have testimony of the divine providence of God because I want to be a part of what God is doing. And the Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that is the reason why I said that that tradition was my tradition and I am breaking from it because the Lord's rebuked me concerning, concerning that tradition. You know, sometimes the Lord tells us, don't do this, and then you go to the extreme end. And that's what I've done. He says to me, focus on raising people. And that's why I don't talk about raising money at all. I, don't, I just don't talk about it. Five years have come and gone. I believe freely have you received, therefore freely give. We continue to preach, pray, and prophesy, and teach, and mentor, and disciple without charging a fee. My wife and I, by the grace of God, have been counseling people in America for 12 years. We've been doing marriage counseling, business counseling, life coaching, without ever demand, demanding a dime from a person. I went for a wedding once before I did all of the officiating and the groom who met me just during counseling came to me and says, oh, how much is the bill? We forgot to ask. I said, there is no bill. He says, no, 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 no. You have spent your time. You have been here. You drove all the way from out of town to come here. I said, freely have I received. Therefore, freely do I give. I say that not to boast in my own ability, but to make a boast in the Lord that I have stayed faithful in my calling without mixing mammon with tabernacle. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
So I'm saying that to make it very clear that the work of the Lord has gone all of these years without money raising. So asking today to step up and make a sacrificial giving is because of the instruction that I have received from the Lord that it is time for you to partner with what God is doing in here so that when the coin comes to pay, it's not just going to be for me, it will be for you also. Only the people who have partnered can benefit from the debt that is settled. Only those who have partnered can benefit from the dividend that is coming. Only those who are in partnership. I say this with all of the love in my heart and the passion for you to be a partaker of what is coming. Because the Lord already made it clear that it is unstoppable. It will come. The word of the Lord says, he that will come will come and will not tarry. Even though he tarries, wait for he will surely come. It is a sure word of prophecy. But this is an opportunity that you have to lift a burden. So that you can say, <laughs> yeah, come on now. We're partners here. And so the Lord said to me specifically, he says, give them an opportunity to pay that amount that you said yes to. I said yes to that amount. I said, I'm going to pay $1,000 for the next six months on top of what we have already agreed to pay. And the reason why I said that is because they told me that we, as well as other people, may not be able to enjoy the benefit of this facility if we all do not step up. We have stepped up and we have continued to enjoy it. And the Lord is saying, give them an opportunity to take that and partner with you on it. And so I want to give you an opportunity today. Alan is going to put the giving slide on. And I want you to prayerfully consider the things that have been said. Let me tell you something. You are not giving to meet a need. That, let that not be your thinking. You are giving to partner with what God is doing in here. There is none of you here who have bought Tesla stock, who have bought Amazon or, or Apple stock, who is, give, who is investing just so that you can buy a mouse for the programmers to use. When you buy stock from companies like Microsoft, you are not saying, well, when I give them this money, they can buy more recycled bins for Bill Gates' office. No, you're not giving to me the need. That's not why you're giving. You're giving because you're investing in something that you believe in. If you believe in what the Lord is doing here, that is how you should give today. Give an offering that will make it a David kind of offering. When David went and was looking for a place to set up the tabernacle, he found a man who had the right lane, and he says, this lane. And the man was like, hey, you must be kidding me. You are the king. Just take it. And David says, God forbid that I give to God an offering that costs me nothing. Let me tell you something. When we give things that cost us nothing, is we're giving out of convenience. And when we give out of convenience, it doesn't produce the blessing of promise. What is the blessing of promise? The Bible says, he that goes forth sowing and weeping with doubtless return, bearing precious seeds. Let me say that again. He who goes forth sowing, Weeping, not the one that just tosses the crumbs. Okay, I can afford to lose this seed. I'm going to give it. Let me tell you something. I am where I am today by the grace of God. And because very early on, the Lord schooled me in generosity. When I was in junior, up until my junior high, I was the stingiest person I know. And I thought I was being prudent and shrewd. I used to talk down my older ones because they spent money anyhow, especially my brothers. My sister was quite shrewd. But my brothers just spent money anyhow. And I would tell them that's not how to do it. And I would save and save and save and save and save and save. And the Lord knew that where he was taking me, I would not get there by being miserly, but I'm going to get there by operating in the spirit of God that is called a generous spirit. Y'all have heard my wife's testimony. My wife already decided even before she met me that she would only marry a man who is generous. And it's not too much to ask because I don't want to serve a God who is not a rewarder. I don't want to serve a God who is not generous. Simply because generosity is a thing of the heart. It is not a thing of convenience. You don't give because you have or because you have to give. You give because you know it is an expression of love. So we need to fix all that because it has not been taught enough here. And I will admit it because I decided that I was just not going to get anybody confused or get anybody thinking that I am in it for the duty because I am not. There are so many ways to make money today. 
That does not even involve you being a blessing to anybody. The devil has structured world economy today in such that people who are not adding value to anybody still become millionaires and billionaires. You ask anyone doing crypto, they will tell you. If you ask the people doing crypto, the crypto, crypto people, what value they are adding to him, humanity, zero. They're not producing anything for the most part. They're just waiting until somebody, maybe not somebody, they're waiting until a lot of people buy into what they have also bought into and then they cash out before the rest of the people wake up. That's what it is. And that is happening in the world. And we become accustomed to that, that it's okay to have wealth without having had it value. But that is not the way of God. The way of God is give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom? They give because you have already given value. And I know that what I am saying today, as much as it may not sound like me, because I see you may be adjusting your glasses to see, is this still the real Pastor Moses? Bro? We were just boasting in the Lord in this man two weeks ago that he doesn't take offerings. And look at him today, he has just put us to shame. No, I am not putting you to shame, but I am letting you know that even a thing like giving, which I have decided that I was not going to get into as I am getting into it today, can change because thus saith the Lord. So I'm going to give you a minute. I don't want you to just give, I want you to put a hole in it. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. When I was in the UK, when you ask people, who are working, doing any kind of work. They may be filing papers. They may be, you know, repairing the side of the road. When you ask them, especially the men, how is it going? They will tell you we have a hole in it. And so I asked them one day, what is that expression? They said the expression came from back in the days when people are digging. They're trying to dig a well. You can be hitting the ground from a distance. Everybody sees you. You're hitting the ground. But when they get there, you haven't even put a hole in the ground. You're still just hitting a rock. So they believe that you have to put a hole in it before you can claim that you have done any work. And so when you give today, I want your giving to be one that can actually put a hole and put a dent in the well that we are trying to dig. Think about it this way. If everybody gave like you today, are we going to be able to continue to do what we do? You see, because many of us, if the blessing of the Lord is coming, we're happy for it to come to just us. But what about the responsibility for the work? It doesn't have to be just you, but you have to be a significant part of it. And so I want you to think about it, and I'm saying this because I need to be as committed to this as anything else that I have asked you to do because it came from the Lord, and we have to do it for the sake of the elect so that what is coming would benefit all of us who have come to partner with the work, to partner together for the work, I mean. So let's just take a moment and sacrificially put our hands upon the plow today. Praise the Lord. And I just want to thank God for my wife's obedience for going in that direction because that helped a great deal in having me go through with it because I, I could have still kind of like shied away from it and postponed it another week. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay, so once we're ready, every single one of us who has just made a commitment to give, I want you to raise your hand or raise your phone, whatever it is, just as a way of demonstrating submission to the will of God through this act of obedience. And I declare over you that in the mighty name of Jesus that none of you shall lose your reward because God is not unrighteous to forget our labor of love and the supernatural things that God has proposed to do amongst us here at Communion House and through us will not be lacking in your life. It will be very evident and it will benefit you. I want to say to those people who will watch this later, about a month ago specifically, the Lord said to me that there are people who are just happy to be takers. When the Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. And one person in particular, the Lord showed her to me, she's just happy sitting down. She never comes here. We've probably seen her face in this building only all of one time. But she watches pretty much every video. 
but no support to the work. This is not social media content. This is a divine assignment being fulfilled. So we're not supposed to treat it as just one of those things put on TikTok just to keep people entertained. We're putting out content to see people transformed. And so for those of you watching online, I want to encourage you, do not treat this content as yet another content to fill your face with entertainment. You know why you're here. You know what this content does to you. Why don't you do something today to be a part of what God is about to do? We're not asking you to pay for what you have enjoyed. We're asking you to plug into what you could potentially enjoy that God is releasing upon this house. And as we all act in obedience and by faith, none of us will lose our reward. And if anything at all, we will receive an abundance of peace, of joy, and of spiritual things, even from this faithfulness that we have demonstrated using mammon in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. God is good. Awesome, awesome. So now let me ask you a question. Are you happy that you came today? Come on, God is good. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. Don't worry. It's one of those things that we have come to enjoy. We are in the season right now of when the Lord says it, you can literally go to the porch and wait to see it. Oh yeah. You can go to the porch and wait to see it. So let me go over some things very quickly because um, again, the Lord is drawing my attention of late to this so happy to see the family sitting in the back there. I don't even recall if I've met you all before, but I'm just really happy to see you. Thanks for coming out today. Yeah. So can you point out who invited you here? Wow. Praise the Lord. God is good. Okay. All righty. Excellent. Is that your sister, Alan? Ah, ah, ah. Boomba, shumba. Come on. Praise God. In fact, I was the one that introduced them to you. Look at that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, God is good. I'm not, I'm not trying to take credit. I just, I said that out of excitement. Okay. But if you give credit, I'll take it. God is good. Well, so good to have you. And I also learned that you sing also. Okay. Well, praise God. Well, thank God for your service to the kingdom. Because I know uh, from what I heard, you've been doing this for a minute. Just leading worship and all that good stuff. God is good. Good to see you. Things happen with us. Okay, my wife said she introduced me to you and then me to them. Yeah. And since I'm still planning to go home tonight, I might as well, you know, just then. Oh, this bothers my wife when it sticks out of my pocket. She says it makes me look like someone who is in the trailer park. There you have it, yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh, you look like someone in the trailer park and needs to keep wiping their face all the time. I said, okay, I'll just put it here. Praise God. So do I look like a minister now? Have I been transformed? Praise the Lord. God is good. So I tell you one of the things that the Lord's been drawing my attention to a lot lately is that we need to recognize that we are in this world, but not of this world. Things happen very differently with us, to us, and through us. But because of the fact that the world has become so um, much more enchanting than it's ever been in all of previous generations put together, we often do things not the kingdom way, but the way of the world. You see, because the Bible says that Jesus speaking, he says, do not be drunk with the wine of their carousing. So Jesus knew that wine will be served by the world and it will intoxicate people. And that was why Jesus warned against this. He says, be sober and be vigilant, especially when you begin to see the signs of my coming. You see, so we've, we've gotten away with um, mingling with the world and doing things the way of the world. And Jesus knew that we would blend in for a long time. But when heaven begins to sound the alarm of the blood moons and the earthquakes and all the things that the false prophet is saying through the media, through the enchantress, all the impiety and all the pompous boasting, we need to wake up and stop drinking the wine of their carousing. 
We used to put on t-shirts of celebrities whose lives are dedicated to Lucifer. We used to have celebrity crushes. We would plaster the walls of our room. I remember when I was about 11 years old, on the wall of my room, I had more photos of celebrities than I had anything about the Lord Jesus. I didn't have a single scripture on my wall, but Arnold was there, Sylvester was there, Dolph Lundgren was there. I thought I was a universal soldier myself, waiting to terminate some enemy. But then I tell you, when the time came, the Lord woke me up and he says that I was a heavenly commando as opposed to an earthly rebel. I'm choosing my words carefully now. But here is the deal. The Lord was still loving and kind because that is who he is. But when the time comes for us to wake up, he expects us to show some responsibility for the grace that we have received. We know how many concerts that we have gone to. We know how many things that we've done just because that celebrity used to do it. There was a time I went to the barber and, sh and when I got home, my wife was like, what happened at the barber shop? I said, I got a haircut. And she was like, did they go, was there a power outage? Did his clipper break? Did he collapse while he was cutting your hair? I said, no, mom. She was like, so how come half of your head is shaved and the other is sticking that way? I said, mama, you ever heard of a guy called Bobby Brown? And my mom was like, did he pay for that haircut? Because if you use the money that I gave you, go back there and level it. How many people remember that hairstyle wearing everything went this way? Yeah. It was not in the book of Matthew. I didn't get that idea from the book of James. I got it from a celebrity that I was following quite closely. Because I thought I was one of the new additions. But I tell you what something folks. I was born again, spirit filled, speaking in tongues, laying hands on my friends. But I was still following celebrities who did not even know where they were going. They didn't know where they were heading, but now that we have seen them, we knew exactly where they have landed. But the Lord Jesus says, I know you're going to be drunk at some point, but when the time comes, be sober and be vigilant. We have come to a time right now wherein we need to read ourselves from all the things that we have taken along the way, the idols, the incenses, and all of those things that stop us from having a vibrant spiritual experience by God. When I say a vibrant spiritual experience, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot fully experience heaven when you are still shrouded with the world. That's why the Bible says you need to first come out from among them and be made separate. Because when the angel of death comes, if you are not found in Goshen under the blood, you will be smote as well. And so we know the reason why God is asking us to be sober and to be vigilant is because he knows that in drunkenness, we will stumble and we will not be able to make it into the ark. It is for our sakes because he's already set in motion and he knows exactly the kind of harvest that he is coming from. So again, in recent times, the Holy Spirit has been reminding me constantly, drawing my attention to the need for us to know that we are very different. The wheat and the tear, they look so much alike. How many people have Googled it since the last time I talked about it? And what did you find? They look very similar. And that was why the ones who planted the wheat, when they said to the owner of the field, oh, it wasn't our fault. The enemy came while we were sleeping, but we, we, we will fix it. The owner was like, you can't fix this. Jesus says, when the time comes, the owner will send reapers. And we know that those reapers are angels who would come with divine ability for distinction to pull the tears and set them ablaze. And so what things they have been given as attributes of being able to recognize the ones who stay and the ones who get removed are some of the things that we need to be reminded of and get ourselves familiar with it because if you and I do not possess those attributes of a wheat, we might be uprooted as a tear. And one of those attributes, Jesus made it very clear. He says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. 
we need to love one another as he has loved us. The world teaches you to love yourself, particularly this generation, is the generation of hashtag self-love, self-care. Everything is all about the self. People say these days they have figured out the way to solve all of life's problems. And the way to solve problems is just to withdraw themselves from people. Oh, come on somebody. If you withdraw yourself from people and you go into isolation, you are, in, you are living in rebellion. Because the Bible says it is not good for a man to be alone. And when God finds people who are alone, what does he do? He orchestrates for them to be in community. The Bible says the Lord places the solitary in families. In Hebrews, the author of the book says, As the day approaching, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves, especially as you see the day approaching. So what do we do? Rather than abstain from people thinking they are the problem, we just need to learn how to love more because regardless of how horrible they might be, love covers a multitude of sins. It is time we woke up and recognize that we might be here, but we are not of this realm. Jesus, when he showed John the beloved what was to come in the last days, he spoke to him about the administration of Satan in the last days. The system that will be in operation in the last days is called Mystery Babylon. It's also called Egypt. It's called Sodom. But the Mystery Babylon side of it is what I want to draw our attention to today. The Bible says, look at the whore of Babylon. The one who sits upon the beast all the kings of the earth are drunk from the wine of her deception the wine of immorality and what does the wine of immorality promise it promises you pleasure for you it doesn't empower you to be a blessing to anyone. It doesn't empower you to fight the good fight. It doesn't empower you to mend the wounded soldier. It doesn't empower you to restore the, 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 the traveler that's been wounded on the side of the road. No, it teaches you to mind your business, take care of yourself, and make sure nobody gets close enough to hurt you. Because it is all about you and just you alone. And when Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, he said when the man was falling, having been attacked by robbers, what is the indication or what is the significance of, of robbers? They represent Satan because he is the thief that comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. After the bandits who are agents of Satan came and attacked the man, the first person, one of the first people to show up was who? The Levite. The Levite came and he was like, I've got Levite stuff to do. You'll be just fine. And if you don't make it, you're not as important as my religious assignment. And the priest came after that. And the priest was like, ah, uh, I'm the priest. I've got priestly things to do. You are not priority. And he walked away. But the Bible says when the good Samaritan came, he attended to the man, took him to an infirmary and paid for him to be mended. And Jesus commended the good Samaritan and it shows that heaven has an expectation for you and I to be good Samaritans. How many people like the new communion house? Wherein I can be just referencing stories and the scriptures will be showing up. This is not, come on, praise God. Hallelujah. This is not AI. Okay, I just make it very clear because it looks like I'm saying it and it's showing up. Unless Alan is using AI. Are you using AI? No, no. So it's not AI, it's AL. It's AL. Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. This is excellent because I saw it. I mean, I was like, man, why, why, why aren't people looking at me? And then I looked and I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, which is what the Bible says to do. The Bible says that we need to look into the perfect law of liberty. So keep looking. Keep looking. You will see the Lord. Here is the deal. The fact that we are being served or that we may have drunk of the wine of deception is the reason why Jesus says we need a time of being sober. A time of taking a step back and saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to go on a detox. I'm going to have myself detoxified of the world by applying the principle of what I call holy hesitation to every meditation because if you do not apply hesitation and meditation, you will continue to per perform the way you've been performing. So you need to take a step back and say, before I say a thing, I would hesitate 
and then I will meditate and find exactly what the word of God says about that thing. It's someone's birthday and without even thinking, you just go and buy a birthday card. It's good to show generosity, but then ask yourself, in scripture, when people are born, what do they get? They actually get things that they can use. I'm not saying stop buying cards for people, but don't just give people cards. You understand what I mean? Because at the end of the day, as soon as you leave, they toss it in the bin. And the hoarders amongst us can be hoarding it, but when was the last time they went to read it? I say, oh, when I turned 17, Mariah sent me this card, and now I'm reading it at 57. Nobody does that. Unless they're, they're cleaning their houses and they see it. And when they see it, they don't even remember. They see, happy birthday, signed, Mariah. Mariah who? And then you don't remember anymore. When Jesus was born, they, the wise men came and gave gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they gave it in that order because they saw that a virgin had just given back to a child. She needs the myrrh because she needs to be mended. She needs the frankincense because she needs to be restored and presented back to the husband as though nothing ever happened. And then these people can't be here. They are a threat to Herod. They would need to survive because anywhere they go to, Herod is looking for them. They will not be able to work. They need gold. They give them stuff that they needed. But the world tells you it's okay to just give a card. At least it's the thought that counts. Where is that in the Bible? That it is just the thought that counts. When the Bible says that it is unrighteous for you to pray for your neighbor who is hungry and tell him the Lord be with you. The Bible says, if he's hungry, give him food. But you see, it is the little things. The little foxes spoil the vine. We need to learn to step out and step, sorry, to step back from the way that we have always done things and begin to recognize that there is a more perfect way. That's what the Bible says. We need to learn that we are not of this world. We need to start to do things differently. The world teaches us that we need to ensure that no matter what happens, we don't miss what's going on in the news. So whatever we do, as tired as we get after work, we still want to listen to the news. It is the worst time of the day to listen to the news. And I can prove it to you. Most of us are tired by 6, 7 o'clock. Whatever that time is that the news is coming. And you know what happens when you're tired, you begin to shut down. So your defenses are down. And someone is throwing things in your face. You can't even resist. You're just believing it subconsciously without even knowing what you're doing. But that is what the world has taught us. And many of us are so dedicated to that. If we would spend as much time... Now I'm talking to the people online because the people at Communion House, we don't spend all of our time watching the news and Netflix... We are actually people who pray, who study the word. Come on, somebody. Yeah, that's, that's what we do around here. But it's your lucky day. You have found this broadcast, and we invite you to be like us. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Stop spending all your time drinking from the wine of the intoxication of the world, the wine of immorality. Stop focusing on the things that benefit only you. Start to think about how you as a creation can better be of service to the creator by serving other people. We need to change the way we think because if we do not, we will remain in that stupor that leads further into the darkness. So today we're just going to read one verse of scripture real quick. And that is on the book of James. And we're going to read James chapter 4 real quick. The book of James is right after the book of Hebrews. It's all toward the end of the New Testament in case you're wondering. James chapter 4 verse 7. This is an express instruction from the Lord, but before I give this instruction to us, we need to have a time of praise. There are certain things that happened, a lot actually, but I'm going to mention a couple that we just kind of like, yeah, so the Lord spoke, it happened, and so what? No, we need to revisit a couple of things because I've been convicted in my heart by the Lord concerning those things. How many people remember a couple of months ago I stood here I think it was toward the end of last year, maybe around September thereabouts. 
And I said, the Lord would have us rise and pray against a war that is avoidable. There was a war that would have been a part of, and I said, I saw two people. That, and one of them has to go because as long as the two of them are there is an unholy alliance that becomes uh, an avenue for Satan to bring us into a war that is avoidable. And I told you, I know who they are, but I'm not going to mention their names, but there are two elderly people and one of them has to go. And one of them was gone just a couple of days after that. You understand what I mean? We haven't given God thanks for that. I don't think so. So that's one thing. The other thing was when the Lord revealed to us that there was an explosion. This is all connected. Remember, I saw an explosion. The angel of the Lord showed me an explosion that the explosion was fabricated to instigate war. And that that war could happen if we do not pray. It will not change the plan of God for the elect, but it will bring a lot of inconvenience to the ecclesia. Do you remember that? And we prayed, and while we stood to pray, what did the Lord say to me? What did the Lord do to me? He took me to a place wherein I saw several groups of people that were no more than the, those of us in the room on the day. We're probably half of the people in this room who were mostly gathered in this corner. And the Lord says, as we were praying, those people were praying too. I saw them gathered, and the Lord says, I have raised from myself regiments of people like you as special forces to declare my will upon the earth. And after we said that prayer, the Lord said to me that they will be exposed. What did we see about two weeks after that? It was exposed as that the explosion that we heard of around the area of the borderline, which is called the U U Ukraine, which is that, that is what it means. So when I think about it, I think about it as the borderline. But Ukraine, when that explosion happened, everybody thought, oh, there's going to be war. And guess what happened? They were like, no, this is what exactly happened. The news was not planning to tell the truth, but the truth just came anyway because the people of God prayed. Praise the Lord. And then I'm going to give us another one. You see, when these things happen, then we pray. The Lord said to us, and this one, many of us need to rekey ourselves into it. I stood here and I said, a prominent leader in the world was about to leave this world. A very prominent leader. And I said, this leader is known for having been involved in the, in the, in the, I'm trying to use a word that is not going to upset anybody. Okay, let me use the word that I used on the day. That this person has been involved in the oppression of several nations of men. In the oppression of several nations of men. Now, I'm not here to justify oppression or to condemn oppression. Because as people, we do what we do to the best of our abilities. Most times what we do is the best that we know how to do. If people are not saved, if people are not born again, please don't have any expectation of them to be Christ-like. You understand what I mean? Don't condemn anybody for not being Christ-like if they are not born again. People are supposed to be led by one spirit or the other. If you are born again, you are led by the Holy Spirit. But if you are not born again, you are led by fear. And sometimes when people are afraid that they don't have much, they go on a rampage acquiring even more than they need. Because it started from the fear of, oh my God, we're, we don't have land. Oh, and we're growing. What are we going to do? Let's go take other people's land. You understand what I mean? That is because they were responding to the spirit of survival. You understand what I mean? Whereas we are led by a different spirit. We are led by a spirit that is actually looking forward to lay down the life. As opposed to preserving the life. Jesus says if you love your life, you will lose it. But if you love it not unto death, you will find it. I need to say that because I know when I said that, I knew what God was revealing to me, but I still had to be careful in delivering it so that it doesn't trigger the emotion within us of, of, of what, what's it called? Um, when, 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 you, when you do not like people, what's that thing called? Um, it's, it's a word like resisting. Res resentment. Wow, you're in the spirit. I did not want it to trigger resentment within us. 
You see, because when God tells you what he's doing, he's not telling you so that you cannot feel like you're better than somebody else or so that you can begin to resent them. The Bible says the Lord is not evil and he will not tempt any one of you with evil. So when God is doing what he's doing, it should be an opportunity for you to wake up, for your light to shine and for you to do good works. Not supposed for you to say, ha oh, ha, finally. No, there's not finally anything. It was by grace that even you were saved. You understand what I mean? And so when I said this person, this leader is known and iconic for having been part of the oppression of several nations. I think it was five days or three days after I said that, the Queen of England passed. And we don't know of any nation within our own generation and two, three, four generations before us who have been able to subdue as many nations as England did. But the Lord said specifically at that time that that will be unto us a sign to recognize that power would truly be given to us, but we need to commit to doing better than the ones before us. How many people remember that? Because after that, the Lord led us into scripture and we read wherein it was said about the children of God who were given reigns over the earth and did badly. Psalms 82, we know that chapter of scripture, we, to, I mean, we know it very well. We've read it multiple times here. God says, you are my children, every single one of you. I gave you power to look after the poor and to, and to help the plight of the fatherless. But you took advantage of them instead. He says, now I am demanding judgment from you. He says, you have lived like gods, but you would die like men. But he started by saying, you are my children, every one of you. He said, but you have not done what I commanded you to do. And he says, I will come and I will repossess the earth from you. And in Ezekiel, he says, now I will give it to the ones that I choose to give it to. And Jesus confirmed it in Matthew chapter 5 verse 5, that the earth will be given to the meek. So G the Lord said to us that that vision was to alert us of what was about to happen so that when it happens, we begin to prepare our hearts for power. So that when that power comes, what will you do? Will you be an oppressor or will you be a liberator? But if God does not warn us concerning these things, many of us have been too beat up by life to ever think that one day we will control things. Let me say that again. You see, many of us from the time that we were born, we have been oppressed. I mean, for crying out loud, I don't think there's anybody here who does not have a birth certificate. Yeah, we all have birth certificates. But how many of us have even stopped to think, what is even the meaning of birth certificate? Birth certificate is the certificate they give to products that arrive on a ship. You understand what I mean? And they adopted it for human beings because now human beings are supposed to be the properties of the state. And that is the reason why you don't get anything done until you present your birth certificate because if we are going to put a label on you called the passport, we need to see your birth certificate. We need to know that you are one of our goods. You arrived here through the water because every one of us were born of water. There's nobody here, even if you were formed in a test tube, that test tube has to contain water. Every single one of us is born of water. And the moment we arrived, they said, You've been birthed. Where did that word come from? The word came from the sailors whenever their ships birth. You see, that's from the time that you were born. The oppression started. And your parents, with all of the resources that they can find to take care of themselves and take care of you, they still have to pay taxes that are usually more than they should. We are taxed too many times. You're taxed on your income. You taxed. So the income is already taxed. But when you go to buy gas, you pay tax again. You buy a pair of slippers to go to the beach to unwind. You, want, you, you, you pay taxes. I remember one day we paid to travel because it was one of those last minute trips. The deal we thought we were going to get on the flight, we didn't get it. I was like, no worries. Let's hope for a deal on the hotel. It didn't happen. So it was beginning to look like an expensive vacation. We got to the beach and a young man said to me, that, do I want a stretcher? Like, you know, those ones that come with the umbrella. I was like, oh, by all means. He was like, it'll be $50. I said, it'll be nothing because I'm going to lay on the sand. I'm like, I'm not paying. My wife already, she heard the tone of my voice. She just kept moving. She spread the towel that we got from the hotel on the sand. 
and just told the kids, you may now play. Because she already knew no one was getting an umbrella that day. I, it just rubbed me the wrong way. I'm like, man, after all that I paid to get here, you want to give me this lousy bench and this umbrella that could be blown at any point in time? I have to do the digging to put it in the ground and you still want $50? I said, not today. It will be nothing because I'm going to be on the sand. I have the picture. My wife took a picture of me. The entire three days on the beach, by the time we came back, I was darker than that chair. <laughs> but that is what we have gone through. That is what's happened to us. You, can, you pay to download music. You pay to buy an LP. And you listen to music that's been dedicated to the warlocks so that they can continue to control your mind. And yet you pay for it. You pay to go listen to musicians whose tongues be mixed with the venom of the serpent so that they can hypnotize you into all kinds of immorality. You listen to certain music and you don't know the reason why you start having all kinds of lust. You listen to some music and you don't know why you suddenly feel like you want to go beat somebody up and you paid for that music. We have been oppressed so much that we don't even know what to do with ourselves when Jesus says, I have set you free. For the Bible says, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. But here we are, we are free, and we don't even know what to do with the freedom. The children of Israel were no different. God set them free. And yet, they could not grasp it because they couldn't, for the life of them, divorce themselves from oppression and slavery. Even though the Lord has set them free, they were free men to possess the land of promise. And that was the reason why the Lord gave me that heads up to share with you that once she's gone. And what did the Lord say to me on the day? Do you remember? The Lord said to me on the day that after, they are, after she's gone, more will follow. But in the interim, others who think that it's now their time. The Lord showed me the ones who have been in the corridors of power, waiting for their time to come. And the Lord said to me that they will come, but they will not remain because it is not yet, it is not theirs. It is just because it is not yet our time. And what have we seen? Let's take the nation of Israel, England, for example. And let's be real, okay? All of the United Kingdom, after the queen passed, what happened? The people who felt like it was now their turn, they were next in line, became the prime minister. She didn't last. Another one's came, coming in his place. And it's not yet his time. It's just because it is not yet our time. They're filling the blanks. And what's happening right now in Scotland, the same thing. And we're beginning to see that in different parts of the world, wherein, in fact, the Nigerian government conducted an election and the one who supposedly won the election, his slogan for the election is Amy Lokan, which means it is my turn. Just to fulfill what the Lord said to us last year. He hadn't even begun his campaign when that word came forth. But he felt like, finally, I can lay hold of power. And he said, it is my turn. Dear fellow, it is not your turn. But just because we haven't woken up just yet, as we should, our father is allowing all manners of things to go on, but not for much longer. So my submission to you today is this. Are you ready to repent? Repentance means a change of heart. Are you ready to drop the heart of slavery to pick up the heart of authority? Are you ready to drop the mindset of oppression and not knowing? You know how we always use the expression, oh, you know, they, you know, that's what they do. Oh, they're not going to let us do this. They're not going to let us do that. One day you will become that day. What will you do? But it begins now. I know that many of us still can't comprehend what's, how it's going to happen. Just like the children of Israel, they didn't know how they were ever going to be free from the most advanced civilization of their time. Pharaoh had his fingers in everything. Pharaoh was so powerful that all of his citizens were on paper his slaves. It's in your Bible. Even in the 66 books, it's there. The Bible says that Pharaoh enslaved all of his citizens because during the famine, they, everybody heard. Joseph's interpretation of what's going to happen. They knew there was going to be seven years of plenty. It was public information. Everybody stored food. And when the famine came, they went to the silos to recover the food. And guess what happened? Their food had been weaveled. Weevils and all kinds of things had corrupted what they stored. 
So they had no choice than to buy from Pharaoh because the Lord gave Joseph the spirit of wisdom to preserve. He built silos with technologies to preserve food. And they're still, he's still making money for Egypt today. People still go to some of those storage facilities and they call them temples. Oh yeah, because the Bible says my house shall be called the house of bread. It was the house of bread, but they call it now a religious temple because they didn't really know what they, I mean, some of them know, but they don't want to admit it is exactly what the word of God says. So guess what happened? They took all of what they had and gave it to Pharaoh. And I have a release by God to tell you this also, because this is exactly one of the things that the Lord's been showing me that I haven't really gone into the details of. They took all of what they have and they gave it to Pharaoh. And when they were spent and they were still hungry, by the third year or so, they all came to Pharaoh. They banded themselves together and they said to Pharaoh, for bread that we may live, we become your slaves. And Pharaoh was supposed to say, oh, you're my citizens. Let me just give you free food. He was like, are you sure? Put your name down here. And that was how they became his slaves. So even his citizens were his slaves. So those people who were crying, oh, Moses, take us back to Egypt. They were going back to double slavery. The ones that the Lord has set free. They couldn't comprehend it because of where they were coming from. Many of us can't comprehend what it means to be free. But let me tell you something. I say this with all confidence in my heart and in the Lord. That it is in our lifetime that we will be free. Hallelujah. In my lifetime, by the grace of God in this generation, we will be free from the ones who have oppressed us and from an ungodly system that has taken advantage of us, who seeks every opportunity and avenue to pit us against one another so that they can continue to weaken us. If you're not Democrat, you're expected to be a Republican. How about if I'm just a saint? I mean, it's not like the elections mean anything for the most part, but let me say this. Yes, my wife calls it selection. But let me say this. Every right and privilege that God has given to me has to have a place in the system. Now, if some people subvert my privilege, it is on them. So when the election comes, regardless of their Perversion, I am still going to exercise my God-given right because God's given me the right to always choose. He said, I set before you this day life and death. Choose life that you may live. And someone says, what if both of what is in front of you is death? Exercise your right and leave the rest to God. Because the Bible says to subvert a man in his cause, the Lord does not approve. Let me tell you something. Many people have stopped voting because they're like, what is the point? The point is not what they do. The point is what you have the ability to do. You're a free man by God. Enjoy whatever is put in front of you. The Bible says, Paul speaking, whatever is said in front of you, receive with thanksgiving without asking questions. Because if anyone is trying to manipulate you and deceive you, it is on them, not on you. So hear me and hear me good. Imagine how much better it's going to be when the time comes wherein you can do that which your heavenly father has asked of you to do without you bending the knee to bear. That time is coming. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So now this is what the Bible says in James chapter 4 verse 7. The Bible says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. In conclusion today, I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, submit your thinking to God. Submit your actions to God. It is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. The Bible says as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. How do you come to be led by the Spirit? When you are under the influence of the Spirit. How do you come under the influence of the Spirit? By being drunk with the Spirit. The Bible says to not be drunk with wine wherein there is intoxication or dissipation or excess. But be filled with the Spirit. If you will be led by God, you must be filled with His Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you are not in submission to Him. To be in submission to Him 
is to say, not my will, but yours be done. So in the times that we are in, I want you to go home today giving thanks to God for the abundance of revelation. Thank God for the things that is revealed to us, that he has spoken over us in this house that has come to pass. Because when we show faithfulness in that which he has done, guess what? We're allowed to come even into the courts. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. And I will say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let me tell you something. We are giving thanks for what he has said that has happened so that the other promises that we have received can be expedited. The Lord has all the ability and the intention to quicken your steps unto righteousness, to bring to fulfillment more speedily, not hastily, but speedily the things he has spoken concerning you. He's just waiting for you to realize one or two things. And one of those things is that we give thanks for what he has done and then we wake up and step back from the world and submit ourselves to the Lord so that the system no longer dictates what we expect, what we do, what we gave, how we think, but the Holy Spirit. You see, one, you see where we're going with this? Now, let me help you with this. The reason why the Lord is asking us to do these things in congruence is because they are connected and this is how they are connected. Many of us, I'm not happy with the system. Many of us have recognized the deception that is in the world. And we're like, oh, I'm not with this anymore. I am now woke. If you are woke and you divorce yourself from the system without attaching yourself to the Lord, you will be broke. Somebody needs to look, af look out for you. Somebody mightier than you needs to take care of you. So don't just divorce yourself from the world. I'm sure you know this is going on right now in the world. Many people are waking up to see that, wow, so the, when the government said this, it wasn't even really the government who said it. It was a group of businessmen who hijacked the government who said that. Oh my gosh, when they told us this, it's not true. Now we are woke, we are woke. We no longer believe in the planets. We are woke, we are woke. But then wokeness or wokeness without you being attached to the Lord is like you saying, I'm coming out of Egypt, but I'm not going to the promised land. Because I don't believe in the promised land. I don't even believe in this prophet Moses that God has sent to lead us. I mean, what does he even have? Just a rod? You see what I mean? So guess what? You will wander and die because the wilderness has nothing. So make sure that once you come out of Egypt, you make it into the promised land, following every instruction that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So don't just, if you know people who are getting woke, celebrate their wokeness and tell them, so now that you're woke, you're coming out of one system, you know that you need to plug yourself into another one because there are no middle grounds. It's one or the other. So if you're breaking the the, the spell of Netflix binging over your life, you need to immediately connect yourself to binging on the word of God. Meditating on it day and night, that's exactly what it means to binge. You are in it day and night. So when you come out of one, you have to plug into the other. And someone is saying, but I, I, I don't know how I got into the world system. I was birthed and I got a certificate to say that I am here, which means now I owe the government the rest of my time. Every work that I do, they get a piece of the action. Every possession that I buy, I pay taxes on it. So I don't know how I got into that mess. So how do I get into this new kingdom that you're talking about? By giving God thanks because thanksgiving let you locate the gate. Praise let you find the court. And when it brings you in, you will now begin to live free and with the authority of what it means to be a child of God. So that is exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to break bread with Isaiah 11 very quickly. So this, um, okay, I want to read this verse 8. I was kind of pleading with the Holy Spirit. I said, I want to read it. I want to read it. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify yourself, you double-minded. The Bible says, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And, and what that means is, just for the people who may not be familiar with where Job, James is coming from, James is speaking this time around in his capacity as a scholar in Old Testament prophecy. When the prophets are like that and they say, oh, let your joy be turned into mourning, what they're saying is let something else begin to speak to your heart. 
those things that used to give you joy. You remember how much joy you used to have once it's 10 p.m. on Friday because you're going to get totally pissed. You know, that, that used to be your joy. You know, young men, your joy used to be the moment you successfully break up with that girl that you've dated only for two weeks and you're about to go catch another one. You know, they tell you that the thrill is in the hunt and you're so eager to go. Those, the Bible says, let those joys be turned into mourning. Mourn over who you were in the world system. Let me say that again. Every single one of those things. Let me look because the reality of it is the children of Israel, when they got into the wilderness, they were mourning that they did not have they did not have onions and garlic. When the Lord is taking you to a land that flows with milk and honey, were they not supposed to be mourning the garlic and honey? Were they not supposed to say, Oh my god, for 200 and something years, we were eating only garlic? But they were they were missing what they were supposed to be rejoicing to have been delivered from. You know, because some of us were saved and sometimes we'll think that we're doing God a favor and we're like, man, if not for this born again thing, I know what I'm capable of. <laughs> oh yeah, I know what I'm capable of. I remember there was this time, there was this guy in Atlanta. He was telling us, he was like, if not because I am saved, I know how much money I can be making. I know the system. And I'm like, wow. So now you're letting God know that you're doing him a favor by being on his side. Because you could be dangerous in the world. You know, many of us, let's be honest, if you are still thinking like that, I have a fix for you from the word of God. Because let's be honest, sometimes your friends, they, they, they tag you in posts of them partying somewhere. It wasn't them who tagged you. It was the demon in them who just wanted to draw you out and, and see whether you're going to fall for the temptation. They were out drunk, partying, and they tagged you, and they said, oh, you should have been here. No, you are where the Lord would have you be translated from the darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And Satan wants you to sorrow over what pleasures are in the world. I mean, you're missing out on both ends. Please, if you cannot wake up to recognize that you're in a better place, you might be better off just going back there so that you don't lose out on both ends. Because you're no longer there, you're here, and you're not enjoying what is going on in here. You're no longer going to the club where you outdanced everybody, but you're here in the church and you can't even move. You, you can't even clap your hands. You understand what I mean? Anybody who knew me in my clubbing days who sees me at church, they'll be like, yeah, that's, that's what he does. Yeah. Whatever he does, he gets into it. Whatever he does, he gets into it. When I was, in the, when I was still clubbing, I would be so intoxicated, I begin to prophesy. I used to play the guitar and I'll be singing. And I'll be prophesying because that was me. I was the life of the party. So why should I now be in the house of God amongst my brothers and sisters and not throw myself into worship and not prophesy when the music is on? Because it, you have to be in somewhere. And I recommend being in here because that one is going away. That system is perishing. So look at what the Bible says. It says, lament and mourn. Weep, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, after you have divorced yourself from the world, after you have detoxed by sorrowing over the things that used to make you happy in the world, some of you have to sorrow over your credit card that has been taken away because you have become so dependent on credit that you don't, long, you don't know how to exercise faith for providence. Many of us are quicker at going to the bank than we are at going to the Lord. And so we, may, we should be ready to sorrow over those things because we have been divorced and separated from mammon. But we're, we're being divorced to be immediately married to the Lord. We, we are not standing in any middle grounds because none exists. Now look at what the Bible says here. The Bible says once you have done that, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. What does praise mean? Praise means you are lifting God up. So when you humble yourself, that's what you're doing. And the Lord is going to make it happen. So Isaiah chapter 11 is our scripture for breaking bread today. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 19. And we're just going to read it very quickly. In fact, 19 may take us too long. Let's just read verse 2. And um, where is my Isaiah today? Um, okay. Isaiah 11... 
And I may just quickly read three verses very quickly. The Bible says in verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. As we break bread today, I know that many of us have questions of, okay, what ex how exactly am I going to repent? How am I going to have my mind changed? I know that the mandate is out there that we need to not be drunk with the wine of the immorality, the wine of the world. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But pastor, man of God, I have questions. How do I go about that? Do does it mean that I need to pray more? Does it mean that I need to, you know, just um, sell everything that I have and give it to the poor and follow you? What does that even mean? I know questions are rising up which is good because the fact that you're even already beginning to think of exactly what you must do is indicative of the fact that you are considering obeying what the Lord said. You're considering partnering with him in holiness. So here is the question. Here is the answer. The answer is this. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need more of the Holy Spirit. How do you get more of the Holy Spirit? Ask him. Jesus says, ask the Father and he will give you the spirit of truth. Ask him to fill you. Lock the door of your closet behind you and say, fill me, Holy Spirit. I want to, I want to experience you in a new dimension. Stay there. Listen quietly. Fall asleep and wake up if you have to. But don't be in a hurry. Give him your attention. Give him your time. And he will fill you. Study the word of God often. And he will fill you. Do not forsake the gathering together of the saints. Because when we come together like this, there is a fresh distillation of the presence of God. And he wants to fill you. He wants nothing more than to be inside of you. To fill you. So let him come in. Do not resist the Holy Spirit because when he comes, he will bring you rest. When he comes, he will fill you with wisdom. When he comes, he will give you understanding. He will give you counsel and might. He will teach you and you will know exactly what to do. The journey from here onward is not what the pastor says or what the pastor's wife says. The journey from here onwards is not what some blogger blabs. It is what the Holy Spirit says to you in your heart. Imagine how amazing our meetings will be when everybody who comes in is already filled with the Holy Spirit. He's already bubbling in the Holy Ghost. Confidence in the God of their salvation. When we come together like that, energized, we produce such a current of power that drives demons so far away that the next time they hear anything that sounds like you people, they beg to be sent into the swine. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to just rest on that note. But I'm feeling like seven is also good. Let's just look at it. The Bible says the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. You need to read this scripture and meditate on it. And I'll tell you why. Everything that you have read is the opposite of what's going on in the world today. The lion does not eat straw like the ox. The lion is bloodthirsty. But in the world to come, where you will have preeminence, the Bible says that the lion will be a straw-eating animal that you can pet. And someone says, is our pastor now a Jehovah witness? Well, I am a witness of the Almighty God. And sometimes you call him Jehovah. Because I know this is where we heard those stories, that a time is coming on this earth where you'll be able to pet the lion. Or did, did you not have Jehovah's witness in the neighborhood where you grew up? Okay, well, I'm telling you, it happened. If it didn't happen to you, I'm sorry for you, you missed out. But here is the deal. The, the real premise is this. We are seeing a description of a world that is different from this one. So now you see the reason why the Lord is saying, come out of the world, change your mind. So that when that world comes, you will not be completely at loss, at a loss. You see, if God suddenly brings heaven to earth right now, many of us will say, no, thank you. Simply because we're not where heaven is. Our mind is still too far in the gutter. You won't even recognize it. Yeah, because you're right. You have to repent to even see it. So I'm encouraging you, let the Lord do his perfect work in you. And I promise you that we're just going to stop there because, um, yeah, that, that's good. That is very good. Oh, yeah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But let me just read 11. Is that okay? The Bible says, it shall come to pass. In that day, 
So I'm just giving you what I'm doing, essentially giving you scriptures for some of the things that I had said earlier on. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. So the Lord is saying again, the way that I delivered them from Pharaoh, from Egypt, from the Assyrians, God is saying from whatever oppression that I've delivered people from in the past, I will deliver you also. I'm going to deliver you from the heavy burdens of taxes. I'm going to deliver you from the heavy burdens of authoritarians. I'm going to deliver you of totalitarians. I'm going to deliver you from every system that is designed to exploit you. I did it once before, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to deliver you from a system that teaches your children immorality. I'm going to deliver you from a system that lies to you. I'm going to deliver you once again. You will be free to worship me. The Lord said to Moses, tell Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. And that is the reason why God is looking for those people who would worship him in spirit and in truth. Because the reason why he wants to save you is so that you are free to express the worshiper that you are. But if you are not a worshiper, you're not welcome here because he's not looking for you. He's looking for worshipers. If you want to make it in and be with him, be a worshiper now because when the reapers come they're looking for those people who are ready for the kingdom ready for the master's use so the Lord says I will deliver once again the remnant of my people who are left I will deliver them from Assyria from Egypt from Patros from Kosh from Elam from Shinar from Hamath and from all the islands of the sea the Lord is saying it doesn't matter where they have taken you I am coming to get you So as we break bread today, we're just going to say, Father, thank you for setting us free. For delivering us from mindsets that, that oppress us. Mindsets that deprive us. Mindsets that make us feel incapacitated. Mindsets that, mindsets that make us feel helpless. The Lord is coming to deliver us from being bombarded with things that we do not approve of. Things that we know that are of the darkness. Almost everywhere we turn today, they are shoving immorality in our faces. They're shoving it down the throat of our children. But the Lord says, I will deliver you from such oppression so that you will be free to teach your children the way of the Lord without compromise. You will be free to open your eyes as you walk because there will be no corruption to see. You will be free to breathe, to drink, to go wherever. Because the Lord has set you free. So Father, we thank you because we, are, we know that we are not that far away from that great redemption. And for that we are thankful and we pray that in the time remaining before we see the fullness of your salvation, that you will keep us under the blood of the Lamb. That as the reapers come to remove the wicked from the earth, that your seal of protection upon us will keep us safe from the actions of the men, of, 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 the, of the four horsemen, of the, of the actions of the angels that bring destruction from the four corners of the earth. That in the meantime, Father, in the matter name of Jesus, even though they're displaying all kinds of error for our children to see, our children will not follow them. In the matter name of Jesus. And for us who remain, Lord, anticipating your return, we will receive an increase daily, in the boldness which we to say no whenever people are speaking guile around us. We're not just not going to listen and pretend like we're not there. We're going to say, no, that's not right. A man should marry a woman and that's it. If people are struggling to define what a woman is, you'll be bold enough to, say, to tell them a woman means a man with a womb, womb man. And if you ain't got a womb, go home. We will be bold enough to tell them. As we wait, we're not going to wait just sitting down doing nothing, but we will wait in the capacity of Christ declaring the love of God. We're not judging people. We're not condemning people, but we're speaking boldly of the love of God. We're not telling, we're not scaring people with hell, but we are encouraging people to come into the light of God's new heaven and new earth. In the mighty name of Jesus, you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. In Jesus' name, amen. My wife doesn't mind if I pray for long. So the moment I notice that I'm preaching for too long, sometimes I just turn it into prayer, but I'm still preaching. If you listen to that prayer, a little bit of preaching was still in there.
But as long as I close my eyes, I'll be fine. I'm not going to get a pep talk on the way home. God is good. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to just hand off back to Alan to close the service. But before we do that, I am very happy to announce to you that our help has been helped. A couple of weeks ago, I think about two weeks ago, I was sitting down and I was meditating on the word of God and the angel of the Lord said to me that there are messengers that have been sent for your sake, but they have been resisted. He says, but you need to pray and send help for your help. As soon as I saw that, I was like, okay, I'm going to pray. And I started to pray. And I just felt like I needed to raise an army, like a quick special forces unit. So I called my brother in Nigeria and I called Alan. I said, it has just come to my notice that there are people that the Lord has sent with answers to our prayers, but they have been resisted by the Prince of Persia and that we need to send for our help also to have help. And we prayed and we give thanks. And yet it seemed like there was still opposition and we continue to persevere. And now I come to you confident and thankful to God because I am told that our help has been helped. Give God thanks. Keep your eyes open. It's a new day. God bless you, Communion House. And I say by faith, I will see you on Tuesday. God is good. Come on, let's celebrate the Lord again. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. We, are, we give God praise for this time of, of fellowship. As I say always, the Lord speaking to us plainly. Let's go ahead and stand as we are prepared to dismiss. We know the man of God has already done the offering here. And let's be encouraged to give to partner as the Lord has seen fit to call us to give us instruction. Even as the woman of God has declared, as we were instructed through her to ask the Lord for the blueprint. And already he's given us instruction. Father, we give you praise. There is none like you. Why don't you just reverence the Lord? You know, the Lord is doing a new thing in this house, and we're so privileged to be a part of it. Yes, Lord. Just love on them in this moment. Draw all that you can from this presence of the Lord that's here to take it home. And Father, we pray that even as you have ministered, just recently, oh God, that we be lifting in our countenance, oh God, that when we go to that place, we go into the workplace, oh God, when we go into our, our family meetings, family reunions, oh God, that you shine through us, oh God, for we know that this is our season to arise, shine, for our light has come. Oh God, that your presence do the ministry, that your presence, oh God, be all that we need, oh God, that our evangelism be effective, oh God, that it be what is needed for those to be saved? For we know that there are many more that are to come. For we know this season, it is time to come into the ark. Father, we give you praise for the man and woman of God of this house. For what you have ministered through them this hour, O oh God, this very on-time word. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. Everyone have a blessed night.